Uh, good morning, good afternoon, depending where you are. Uh, I, ha I hope that you had a good uh, consumer rights day uh, celebrated on 15th March. Uh, we would like to start uh, our webinar uh, today, a series of webinars that um, uh, the African organization is doing. Yeah. And uh, one of the key issues that we'll be discussing this whole year is on uh, the implementation of the AFCFTA. Uh, as you know, the celebration of the consumer rights uh, on uh, 15th March, uh, we would like today to understand if uh, the agreement that have been signed and that actually entered to, into implementation on 1st January uh, 2021 uh, is going to work for us. When we talk about the consumers, we are talking about all of us. Uh, 1.3 billion of people on the continent that actually will be reaching around 1.7 billion in 2030. Uh, how is the AFCFTA? when we look in 10 years to come, will be working for us. Especially today, we have uh, uh, speakers. Uh, the first speaker will be uh, Dr. Francis Mangeni, who is the head of trade promotion and program at the AFCFTA uh, Secretariat, Accra in Ghana. Uh, we are uh, sorry that Mrs. Ron Omar could not join us today from the AUC, but we'll have the private sector that's on automotive industry, the CEO of Volkswagen Mobility Solution in Rwanda, Serge Kamuinda. We will also have the chairperson of the African Organization for Standardization Consumer Committee, Chimera Henry, and we will also have the vice chairperson of ISO Coporco, which is also the consumer policy committee for the ISO, International Standard Organization, uh, Ms. Sadi Daito. Uh, without further delays, uh, I would like uh, to start with uh, Francis uh, Mangeni. Uh, who will discuss with us the AFCFT agreement benefit all Africa from Cairo to Cape Town, from Dakar to Dar es Salaam, buy Africa and build Africa for sustainable African industrialization. Uh, Francis, uh, you can start your presentation. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, Secretary General Emojin. Uh, I would like to start by thanking you for uh, inviting the Secretariat of the African Continent of Free Trade Area uh, to one of your legendary monthly webinars, <laughs> uh, for which I really commend you. I think you are really sustaining uh, the momentum. Now, uh, let me share my, of course, a presentation to make. And if you don't mind, let me. I try to share it. Um, right, so here we go. So then building Africa through consumer lifestyles. Now, uh, the foundation is this, that Africa is a market of 1.35 billion consumers. This is big, it's comparable to the biggest markets around the world. And I would like to start by making these eight observations which are foundational structural in nature. And the first of all, the first one is that the AFCA, the AFCFTA supports critical levels of investment and value chains. This is extremely important because we have a huge market, a $3.4 trillion economy, consumer and uh, uh, business spending is already estimated at more than $5 trillion a year. There is strong political will to achieve the African continent of free trade area. For instance, we negotiated it 
and it entered into force. And then we started trading it on it in under five and a half years, which by international standards is a record time. The African continent of free trade area is rule based and provides predictability, which is extremely important for both investors and consumers and business generally speaking. And implementing the African continent of free trade area will produce policy and regulatory reforms. Um, the, the instruments, the various agreements together with the annexes have got lots of rights and obligations which need to be implemented. The business environment and ease of doing business will improve, which is good news for everybody. And the African continent of free trade area aims for structural transformation. That means decent jobs and incomes and improved living standards. This means you'll have money in your pockets uh, to purchase what you want and live a lifestyle that you want. The African continent of free trade area is to be fit for purpose. It must be fit for the fourth industrial revolution and society 5.0. Now, public procurement is a huge market in Africa and it should be looked at as a way of promoting uh, small to medium scale enterprises, which can be suppliers, regional value chains as well, and the rules of origin uh, for Africa are meant to build Africa. They are meant to enhance made in Africa. So this point eight here is extremely important in that it addresses productive capacity, some of the things that we can do to build productive capacity. But what I've been say, saying so far is to set out the, shall I say, benchmarks uh, in the African continent of free trade area, which will help to boost productive capacity, to boost build, made in Africa and build Africa. Now, we have good blueprints for the future. We are not short of uh, visions for the future. However, the change that we want, whether it's political, economic, cultural, mental emancipation, especially through social political processes, begins with you and me. How you feel, what you think about all the time. You remember it says, as a man thinks, so is the man. So we need a mindset change to be aligned to the times and the vision that we seek to achieve. But we have a challenge in trying to achieve this vision of a, an integrated, peaceful and prosperous Africa under Agenda 2063. The challenge of poverty, informality and safety and quality of products, a mediocrity, you know, no, no regulation at all. We are small timers, apathy, lack of motivation, and basically lack of enforcement of regulatory frameworks. You go to marketplaces and you, what you see there is, I can't breathe. So then how do we produce safe and posh products, products that are presentable, that we are proud to consume and to have, while creating decent jobs, raising incomes, improving the quality of life of our people and protecting the environment? How do we produce and consume proudly African in these circumstances? So first we dream, we, which of us has dreams? Eh? We dream and then we produce in order to achieve socioeconomic transformation. We use a developmental approach to regional economic integration. That means we need large markets for critical levels of investment, industrialization in order to have products, infrastructure to promote competitive, competitiveness and political and macroeconomic stability in order for things to happen. However, everywhere we look, we have constraints. You may have these dreams, these ideas that you want to commercialize, but commercialization is very difficult to uh, go about, to get started. Actually, most people don't know exactly what to do. So this means we need incubation centers. We need hands-on assistance. Regulation and licensing is extremely complicated for our SMEs. We need a facilitation of uh, uh, registration and licensing of our companies. Technology and tools, very difficult to come by. Market information, very difficult to come by. Non-tariff barriers hinder trade. Management skills are short in supply by our companies. High taxes, expensive money or credit is difficult to borrow money from banks. And competition from substandard and illicit products. These are all cha challenges that our SMEs face and which therefore res restrict uh, building of productive capacity or made in Africa or building of Africa generally, which we need policy reforms to address. So after we dream and commercialize, then we test and see. Right? The test is in the pudding, as they say. So our products need to be of high quality. They need to be well presented. 
and there must be trust and reputation on the part of the producers in order for consumers to feel comfortable marketing and distribution logistics facilitate access and visibility so these products should be there and they should be visible we should be able to see them made in africa should be avoidable and available if for instance i'm looking forward to hearing what my brother sergey is going to say if for instance you say we are produ producing cars but you don't see them on the streets at all or we can't afford them then we need something to do about that Innovation, therefore, is an essential imperative to grow our economies, and we innovate, solve problems to pursue our passions, and out of innate uh, curiosity. Innovation is of products, but also of the continent itself. So then, I would like to begin to wind out, to wind up, and uh, I'd like to share these tools which uh, are available to promote access to products and to build Africa. First of all, there's the website, of course. But we have a, an online system for addressing non tariff barriers at tradebarriers.africa. We have got tools for market intelligence, for instance, the Africa Trade Observatory at ato.africa. And we have got apps. Uh, we have got also lots of online markets. I will draw your attention to fashionomics.com, which I'm sure consumers will be interested in, as well as the uh, Africa Medical Supplies uh, Platform, amsp.africa. Uh, so these tools help to utilize um, uh, the African continent of free trade area in order to build Africa. Now, uh, this is the action plan. This is the way forward. We need to be the Africans we want if we are to build Africa. Therefore, Africa needs each and every one of us. It needs you, it needs me. We need to implement the African continent of free trade area as the single African market. It's a complete solution. Regulatory agencies should perform, including standards bodies, technical and health standards bodies. We need to create a friendly business environment through policy reforms. We need to have a cultural and social political relations to be proudly African. And we need to develop an entrepreneurial approach to education and training uh, so that people graduate, our students graduate uh, from universities, from vocational institutions, training, technical training institutions, not just with the certificates, but also with businesses or with bankable uh, proposals. So what I have been talking about is how to build Africa. Now, once we have this productive capacity, once we have products on the market, products that are safe, that are fit for human consumption, then we have got somewhere to go. And then we talk about protecting the consumers through standards bodies, for instance, uh, through domestic laws, but also through utilizing the African continent of free trade area regimes on dispute settlement, on public health and safety, on environmental standards, on morals, on cultural diversity, on food security and perishable products. So all this then can be invoked. They are provided for in the agreement establishing the African continent of free trade area to protect consumers. And consumers can be uh, uh, help uh, uh, transform, I should say. They should have a mindset to be proudly African and to buy our products which are made in Africa. And we ensure products are made in Africa through using our rules of origin, through regional value chains, and if possible, through public procurement reforms. Thank you so much. Uh, Secretary General Hemogen, I have used only nine and minutes and 44 seconds. Oh, you. Thank you very much for using wisely the time. Yeah, thank you. You, you, yeah. you the 30 seconds that that's uh, you, you have given me now, I can ask you a question. Yeah, uh, you, you really discuss, you show, you have uh, uh, shown us the the constraint of the SMEs. Uh, one of the constraints that you, you have listed is non-tariff barrier. And uh, on one of this, the slide, uh, you said that we need quality product that our consumers can trust and affordable, and affordable. Their affordability is where I am looking at. Yeah, do you think the agreement that have been signed that we have started implementing from 1st of January has taken care of what are these constraints 
and we can be sure that probably in the five years to come, probably in 10 years to come, we will be trusting the products that are uh, from Africa, as in your own word, you said, product, proudly African product for the consumers. Yes, yes, very much so. Now, uh, I would like to uh, address uh, the issue you have raised uh, under three uh, sets of remarks or categories. First of all, there are national measures, national uh, instruments or tools that can be used, such as contract law or torts, uh, which protect consumers in case of dangerous products or products that say uh, hurt or injure people or products that, that are not according to contracts. And then, of course, there are standards bodies at the national level to, to protect consumers. Then there are mechanisms for national consultations, which should take on board, hopefully, consumer associations, uh, so that uh, their input is taken into account in, in making regulations, passing laws, and ensuring that consumers are protected. So then, and then uh, there are third dispute settlement mechanisms, which uh, include at the national level, private international, or even intergovernmental, uh, at the intergovernmental level. So this can also be used to protect consumers. Now, having said that, when it comes to the African continent of free trade area, there are set, certain uh, basic tenets you find there. First of all, there's the right to regulate. Governments always have the right to regulate in the public interest. And that means also in the interest of consumers. Secondly, there are general exceptions to all the rules which are in the African continent of free trade area, which governments can resort to. This include to protect public health, public safety, the environment, morals, to ensure cultural diversity, and to ensure food and nutrition uh, security. So these instruments are available under the African continent of free trade area for governments to use to protect consumers. Perishable products, there are provisions on perishable products. And then non-tariff barriers. We actually have an online pl platform for addressing non-tariff uh, barriers. In dispute settlement, third parties or any other person can also be heard when there's a dispute, and this can include consumer organizations. There are requirements for publication and notification of laws, for transparency so that people, consumers, the general public know which, role, which rules apply and so that they can use them to protect themselves, to enforce their rights. Now, having said that, we are still going to do or to have more negotiations. And one of the key instruments or protocols that we are going to negotiate is the one on competition policy. Now, as you know, competition policy usually has a section on consumer protection. And there, I think we shall zero in on specific provisions that protect uh, consumers. So that's what I can say uh, about this. But regarding the constraints of SMEs, uh, we take a development approach to human integration. So, so there are provisions on infant industries, on safeguards to protect uh, domestic industries. All this policy space is embedded there, as well as even in liberalization, you don't liberalize 100%. 3% of products are excluded and 7% are sensitive products. So all this flexibility is meant to protect SMEs if government wishes to do so. So that's what I can say. And back to you, uh, Francis, Chair. You, you talked about the negotiation on the competition rights. Pro yeah, protocol, it, yes. Protocol. Uh, how are you going to include these SMEs? Yeah, because I, I, it's very now crucial that the, the, there is a participatory uh, mechanism on this competition protocol. Uh, do, 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 do you think the voice of the SMEs will be heard, the voice of the private sector? Yes, there are actually uh, maybe three ways in which uh, uh, the private sector can make input into negotiations, uh, including consumer associations. Uh, the first one is uh, at the national level when governments are formulating their positions, their negotiation positions. So it would be helpful if there are consultative processes at the national level, such as the interministerial committees or interinstitutional committees, where stakeholders provide their input as government pre prepares national negotiation positions, or even at the regional level, there can be uh, a provision for the private sector to actually participate in national consultations. 
A second way is to include private sector actors, including consumer, representative of consumer associations in the delegations, in the government delegations that go to negotiations. So that as the government officials are speaking or whomever they designate to speak, it could be a private person is speaking, they are constantly getting support or being backstopped by the various you know, officials and, uh, and members of the delegation who are there. So that's the second way. And then the third way is to actually prepare position papers, technical papers, which can be disseminated to inform the negotiations. These technical papers can be shared with the secretariat. They can be published in the media. They, they, they can actually just be disseminated through the public media in order to inform the negotiations, to shape public opinion. But uh, the, most, the more effective way is if there can be this organic partnership with the secretariat so that these technical papers can actually be presented in the actual negotiations through the secretariat or through consultants from the secretariat hires. So this Thank is what I can say about that. that. Yeah, that, that, yeah, the ball is in our in our court, really. If if we can also even uh, use technical papers to to right. contribute to to the negotiation process. Thank you, Francis. Thank you very much. All right, uh, you're welcome. You can, you can continue sending the questions on the chat box. Uh, those also using French, there is interpretation. Uh, you just click on the globe, then you choose your language. Uh, I would like to move to our, our next speaker, uh, the CEO of Volkswagen uh, Rwanda, uh, Serge Kamuhinda. Uh, it's, uh, you heard it. You heard it that uh, the AFCFTA is for you, and uh, there is actually the, the protocol on competition that is going to be discussed. And uh, you can also contribute to it. We would like to know a uh, currently on the role of the private sector as the key stakeholder in the AFCFTA. Uh, you produce locally, mainly on uh, the, the, the vehicles. Yeah. How do you see the policies and the regulation uh, in, in, in uh, it might be in Rwanda, but Volkswagen I, I, is, is a, a, a global player on automotive. How do you see policies and regulation helping you uh, in accessing the market? Uh, Serge. Thank you very much. Uh, Hermogen, I think, I hope you can hear me. Yes, yes, we can uh, hear you. I'm trying to, sh to share my screen, but to answer directly your question, um, regulation and policies create the market. Uh, the demand is there, but there are always imperfections that, uh, um, that do not allow um, to have a functioning market, and hence why um, we rely on, on the good work that, um, for example, the Secretariat is doing to create the market. Can you see my screen, my presentation? Yes, I can see. Yes, I can see. Okay, excellent. Um, so I'm going to jump straight in the presentation to allow more time. Um, as uh, my predecessor has said uh, from the Secretariat, there's a, an enormous opportunity awaiting us with, um, with the CFTA. Um, we have a status quo whereby, um, and I think it's also important to note, it's not our first time that we are trying to industrialize as Africa. Uh, we have had uh, attempts in the 60s leading to, to the 80s, and then we had the structural adjustments and um, the manufacturing sector in Africa has been shrinking ever since. And now um, we have, of course, very low motorization rates, which also means that people are not able to, to, to really move towards their opportunity. Many people spend a lot of time wondering how to move from one city to another. Um, escaping accidents and so on and so forth and uh, enduring the problems of poor air quality. 
And so that is the status quo, but there is the potential next door with the CFTA. And it is important to note that um, if you look, for example, at India, uh, should we implement the CFTA in its most basic form, we would be able to have uh, a, a manufacturing sector similar to India in the automotive sector, um, because Africa has actually more, um, um, a bigger size of uh, middle income earners in Africa than India. And we'll be able to have the likes of uh, the, the brands we know in, uh, operating in India. So, and of course, the more we are integrated, the better we become. Um, and we see that with the increasing economic uh, growth, the new car sales are going to grow year by year. And the question becomes, who will produce them? Are we continuing the status quo of importing cheap, polluting cars? Or uh, are we going to do something ourselves? And here, I would like to stress one important thing. It was possible in the 50s to have a car from Europe operating um, in Africa, despite the poor road condition. But moving forward, the new standards of, of cars that are connected cars, electric cars, um, are such that you will not be able to operate a car manufactured mm -hmm. in Asia or Europe in the next couple of years in Africa. And so we'll be really left behind uh, for centuries if you are not able to, um, to connect with the global value chain and to also try and shape our mobility. So I wanted to show you in, in brief what can be done to unlock the automotive potential. And each theme you will see is about standards. Number one, we have a problem of uh, age um, vehicles and this frustrate any um, local capacity. You've seen, for example, the problem in Nigeria where the taxes on used cars have been reduced. And so unless there's a common understanding of the age limit of used cars across the CFTA area, we are going to shrink the CFTA market and we are going to outsource our manufacturing capacity. So we, use, we need um, um, a, a common understanding of age limit, car, uh, of age limit for used cars. Then we have the issue of fuel quality, and I'll go in detail about it to just illustrate the problems we sometimes have with standards. But there as well, as you know, each engine has specific fuel quality, uh, and we are now even moving towards electric mobility. Unless there is a, a harmonized way to look at this problem, um, we shrink our market. Uh, you cannot have East Africa have a different uh, fuel quality than West Africa. If you have that, it means your market is only as big as East Africa or West Africa. Then there is an issue of low income and affordability. And here <clears throat> as well, um, you look at um, how we can uh, work together and address the risks that uh, financing institutions identify. For example, uh, the issue of after sales and re a resale value or residual value of the vehicle. And if we have that, it is possible to, to ensure that the, the, the financing cost uh, becomes lower. But there's also uh, the opportunity provided by mobility services. And for example, you have different rules now in African cities as to which type of car is allowed to provide mobility services. You all know the very, um, sad picture of old polluting taxis in Africa. But there are some other countries where you go and find new taxis. And so it would be interesting if Africa, for example, uh, could have a harmonized way to look at this thing, because at least you can ensure that people driving new cars are not obliged to buy them and are play, paying the service of being driven. But you will also thereby support the local industry. Uh, you, there are, for example, uh, discussions around Africa in Lagos, for example, as to what type of quality should uh, car, taxi cars have. 
Then there's uh, the issue of infrastructure. And uh, here, the issue of infrastructure is very important when it comes to trade infrastructure, uh, trade logistics, because they impact on the cost of the vehicle. And uh, it cannot be when you have, for example, um, countries with access to ports to sea that are frustrating um, um, landlocked countries with um, processes that are not transparent, uh, with costs that are not transparent. And so we should all aim to increase volumes as opposed to increase unit costs uh, of trade logistics. And lastly, there's the political will. And the, the political will is really about, as my predecessor has said, to have a shared vision. And this political will has to also look at um, the current um, evolution of the sector. As I said, if you are not doing anything, we will be lagging behind for centuries. Simply speaking, the world would be going towards connected cars that require a smart city to operate in. They would move towards uh, electrical cars, uh, towards self-driven cars, and will still be struggling with uh, cars that are uh, with bad fuel. So here I wanted on the issue of fuel quality to deep a bit, uh, to, di to dive a bit deeper and show you sometimes um, the challenges that we have and the necessity to have a public-private dialogue around standards. If you look at fuel, there's a lot of talk about the emissions of a car, but many people forget that in order to arrive at the emission, you also have to look at the inputs. What type of fuel um, are you importing as a country? Is this type of fuel corresponding to the standards you have put in place? And is it monitored even at the level of uh, pump uh, at start gas station or do people uh, do some funny things with the fuel? And only then can you talk about uh, uh, emissions. And here, no one can do it alone. As private sector or as automotive OEM, we have to build uh, engines that are uh, fuel efficient and that have a good emission standards. And this, if we have done it, for example, uh, you know that many cars uh, in Europe have adhered to strict emission standards. But uh, once you've done it, it's not enough. If you import that car now in Africa, it may not be driven because the fuel is bad, or you may find that the fuel in terms of policy is good, but the implementation and the monitoring has not been done. And here we, we are talking about the private sector importing the fuel, but also about the, the institutions around setting the policy and monitoring it. And sometimes you have a discrepancy whereby you have one body setting the standard and the other body reg, uh, regulating the enforcement and both do not talk to each other or have a different agenda. And uh, this is where I think we have to make sure that we're all talking, reading from the same script. And I think one topic for the CFTA Secretariat is to spread best practices that have been identified at some places. For example, we saw in Kenya recently, they've um, really um, or, um, adopted um, um, strict regulations around age limit. In Ghana, there's a new automotive policy looking at uh, fuel um, quality. And so you would have always pockets of excellence around different topics. And so one thing the CFTA Secretariat can do is to spread the good practices and the good, and, and see, say, if you want to solve that problem, we know already an African country that has done it, and here is how they did it. Um, so, I want to end um, with the challenge that the CFTA is posing to us. If you look at the, at the negotiations right now of the rules of origin, um, we are being told that um, we have to arrive at 40% local content. Um, but if you look at the capacity, the current capacity of African suppliers, for example, only 5.2% um, there's only 5.2% of intra-African component supply. And it would take many years to arrive 
and a lot of investments to reach a 40% local content. So if a country wants to do it or a region wants to do it by itself, it's almost mission impossible. What we need rather is that each region or each country focuses on one, um, one part uh, of the cake to reach the 40%. So that if I want to have 40% in one given region, I can import uh, from African suppliers from all over the CFTA area. But, and here we need a lot of pedagogical skills from the secretariat to convince people that they should abandon the nationalistic approach towards manufacturing and really embrace the theory of comparative advantage and of continental supply chain. And um, he, uh, if, unless we are able to do it, we shall see that uh, only few countries, South Africa, Morocco, Egypt, will be able to, to have a capacity uh, to, to abide by the CFTA rules. And then the remaining countries will not be able to do it. And what happens when countries are not able to reap benefits from a regulation, they circumvent it. So you would have, you see the rest of all uh, the CFTA signatory countries um, lobbying for all sorts of derogations of the rules because they are not seeing an interest in it. And so what we need is to have a common vision for one value chain and tell everyone, look, walk around that value chain and also look at the future. The future is a, is a car where the, 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 the majority of the value will come from software and from the battery. And so uh, we are not looking at a, at a Ford assembly line. So here we need to also see the benefits of the future and that you can actually even be a landlocked country, but contribute into that value chain because maybe you are focused on, on the software uh, of the car. So I hope I have not gone beyond my time. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Ah, thank you, Serge. Very, very interesting. Uh, I, I didn't know actually that eight out of 10 vehicles are uh, the second hand cars on our continent. It's very, very interesting and conflicting at the same time because you said that uh, we have uh, emission limits in Europe. And I guess those eight out of 10 cars are not coming from South Africa or Morocco or Egypt, as what you were saying. Yeah, that would be double standard. And the environment doesn't have borders. The environment doesn't have borders. If we have emissions, pollution, air pollution from one country, can, we can all be affected. The other mm -hmm. issue, we all travel. Yeah, we all travel, we host international meetings on the continent, we should also protect each other. It, my question is, now, what, what do you think uh, Francis, who is sitting in Accra, Ghana, uh, can do uh, at a policy level to help? Uh, I know you mentioned the win-win, comparative advantage, uh, which is very, very key. What do you think that now the secretariat, the AFCFTA secretariat should do mainly for this automotive industry to grow? Thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity. Um, you see, the secretariat has a very tricky role. Um, but as uh, Francis has said, um, we have as private sector the responsibility to explain our case, to do position papers. And for the automotive sector, we've gone beyond. We've actually built a Pan-African organization called AAAM, and that organization produces those position papers and is in touch with uh, Francis and his colleagues. Now, what we, we would expect from the secretariat is to uh, tell the delegations that come to the negotiations you come to negotiate with the uh, public uh, uh, interest, maybe with uh, your country position, but here is the position of the private sector, of the continental private sector. And your position that you are negotiating has to pass that reality check. And so we expect 
the C uh, CFTA Secretariat to be a mediator between the various conflicting uh, positions that can inform uh, the, the, the final rule of, say, the rule of origin. Uh, it's, going, it's going to be a, a compromise uh, out of all signatory countries. But that rule of origin would not be of uh, value if it does not pass the reality check of the private sector. And, and we need then uh, to have a step in the adoption of that rule that allows for a continental dialogue between the private sector and the public sector. And I would assume that would then be the CFTA in order to have the final rule. Because the, the fear is that you can have a final negotiated rule and then it's been forwarded to private sector, kindly implement, and the private sector will tell you it's not possible. It doesn't make sense from all 100 years of experience that we have, it can't work. And then you, you, you would have the, um, the status quo staying. So before the final rule is adopted, it will be important that there's a continental public-private dialogue. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Serge. Uh, there, there are other questions from the chat that I will come back to you later on. Uh, some of the question you can even be reading, uh, but I will come back to that. Thank you very much. And uh, we hope that this 40% uh, <laughs> from the rules of origin, we will reach it very soon, not in uh, decades. Uh, when we, disc we start the public-private sector dialogue and the comparative advantage from the countries. Thank you a lot. Our next Thank speaker uh, is uh, Henry. He's going to discuss with us uh, the, 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 the consumer's right, the consumer's voice. Do consumers count when you look at the standardization and the promotion of quality culture in Africa. Henry uh, Kimera is uh, the Arzo Consumer Committee Chair. Henry, uh, you can start your presentation. Dan, please share the presentation. Thank you. Henry, you can see the presentation, you can move forward. Thank you. Yes, um, I'm going to speak about the consumer as a missing link in standardization and promotion of quality culture in Africa and making consumers count. Next, please. Next, please. The, my approach will be a brief on uh, Arasukoko then consumer the missing link the role of aras coco actions milestones and then conclusions as take out next please um Arasu coco is an organ of Arasu and uh, focuses on consumer affairs for those who might not have had an opportunity to know to know about it the consumer Affairs obligation is enshrined in the Arasu mandate, objectives, functions, and scope of work. And you will get to know that all this was signed in January 1977. So uh, with, uh, specifically with objective D, that promotes social, industrial, and economic development and to provide consumer protection and human safety by advocating and establishing activities concerning standardization in Africa. And in E, Arasu is entitled to create appropriate bodies in addition to the organs of the organizations for purposes of fulfilling its objectives. And one of its objectives is consumer affairs. So Arasu Koko has mandate, objectives, functions, and organs that report to designated organs and work of scope. Next. So 
colleagues, Arazoko core objective is to integrate consumer views in standards, provide fora for exchange of information, also to identify aspects of standardization which require legislative and regulatory interventions further to study and help uh, to study means of helping consumers to benefit from standardization and means of improving consumer participation at national regional and international standardization further to mobilize consumer bodies to participate at national regional and international standard setting and incorporating consumer representatives as an appropriate in appropriate technical committees next please so having said that colleagues consumers as a missing link indeed consumers are a missing link given the challenges that are at national at first at individual level as, as consumers at national regional and global level but it's worth noting that the missing link, the consumers, are the largest socioeconomic group in the economy whose voices, needs, and concerns are suddenly not heard, and they are affected by decisions that are taken where they have not participated. So that against that background, consumer protection is a foundation, is a fundamental policy for the development of sustainable and healthy markets like the Africa Free Continental, uh, the, uh, the Africa Continental Free Trade Area. And I would like to say that the missing link, once empowered, consumers make informed decisions in accordance to their needs and means, thereby playing an, an active role in the marketplace a marketplace that the, the, the continental free trade area and also speak out if concerns arise co contributing to standardization and nurturing the quality culture when they provide feedback so it is very key to give consumers an opportunity to participate as the missing link next please next okay thank you consumers they are the most valuable assets to business. Unfortunately, in the African continent, we are kind of a supplier driven market where it is a kind of a take it or leave it trend due to in, a lots of challenges with regards to policy, legal and regulatory at plus institutional frameworks. So it is important to rethink the approach of consumer protection principles and mechanism is very key because fraud consumers experience in goods and services they access isn't sustainable affecting health the environment and social economic attributes uh, further then negatively impacting the national regional continental and global humanity agendas like national development plans. Uh, Francis shared with us the Africa we want, the 2063 agenda, the, also the agendas of the continental free trade area, our source agendas, even plus the sustainable development goals. All these are negatively impacted when consumers or consumer protection principles are not rethought. Next, please. So what is the role of Araso Koko in promoting, con promoting consumer involvement in standards and promoting the culture of quality culture, plus making consumers count? Our role at Araso Koko is major and cardinal. And further, the role is well cut out in the ASO mandate and it helps in promoting issues to do with consumer protection. But this cannot be realized. And that's why there is a need for effectively implement, uh, Araso Koko effectively to implement its role 
and making the missing link and scaling up the promotion of consumer voice and quality culture from a national and up to the continental level, there is a need to boost the respective and continental um, aspects. So the role of Araso Koko has to be Im implemented effectively as enshrined in its a set agendas. So addressing the challenges impacting the African consumer and Araso Koko is paramount and it is a driver for continental sustainability and socioeconomic growth. Gradually, it will reduce on the burden to consumer health, to the environment, to business operations and economic loss and waste. So it is very key to make sure that Araso Koko plays its major role and realize its objectives further. Next. So actions that need to be taken for a lasting and result-oriented Araso Koko's role from Araso uh, to the free, uh, the free uh, con uh, continental free trade area, AU, member states, through partnerships, must roll out consumer empowerment consumer awareness to build capacity to speak out, influence standards, and also promote quality culture. National consumer protection uh, frameworks should be prioritized and operationalized. Frameworks facilitating consumer participation and representation should be prioritized. There should be martial plans for investment in standards development that are cognizant co of consumer participation at national regional and continental level. Thus that uh, Araso Koko should be prioritized and operationalized. Then Marshall plans for investment in quality infrastructure should be prioritized and operationalized. Those are key actions that can facilitate the role of Araso Koko and consumer participation. Next. Next, please. Okay. So it is already it is also important to look at the benefits of an effective Araso Koko. The benefits and the uh, benefits of an efficient and effective and efficient Araso Koko are many, right from individual consumers up to the continental free trade area and global economy. These include empowered consumers who have got confidence and trust in goods and services, and also facilitating and participating in intra-Africa trade plus global trade. Once consumers have got that confidence, they will be able to buy the motor bills, to buy goods that are produced, knowing that they have the quality. Participating in standards development, an effective cocoa also will promote the visibility, availability, and applicability of African standards in consumer goods and services. Also promote consumer rights and responsibilities, leading to solidarity and consu strong consumer voice on the continent. Improving consumer inclusiveness, exchange of reliable information and data, and also leading to conformity and safeguards and participating also in the digital economy. Next, please. Next, please. Next, please. It seems okay. Our current business, uh, our current business at uh, pre constituted with all members having their appointments and their terms of reference in place. Members are from African member states, and currently we have held four productive. Um, general operations and planning meetings in accordance to our terms of reference. Member states currently are doing stakeholder mapping 
develop uh, work plans and compiling consumer views that will be incorporated into the continental working documents. Further, at the Arasokoko, there are committees and working groups along the thematic areas that were prioritized as child product safety, food safety, household appliances, environmental protection, and eco-labeling, cosmetic product safety, and medical product safety. These are committees that we are currently working in and rolling out. Next, please. Having said all that, find that there is a need for this partnership and making sure that we deliver. The partnership should be where the consumers are, different service providers, national standard bodies, and other regulators that aim to realizing the consumer safety, consumer participation, and in, in between we have Araso and La Araso Coco to raise consumer awareness, to enable consumers understand their rights and responsibilities, to strengthen national bureau standards and regulators, to examine and partner to ensure compliance and provide feedback to build consumer confidence, further to ensure that service providers knowledge and skills to improve and meet the requirements of standards and consumer safety. Partnerships for awareness, knowledge sharing to realize effectiveness. Next, as I conclude. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman and, and colleagues, to enhance consumer empowerment, education and access to information to facilitate informed decisions at all society levels needs to be made a priority to promote policy, market accountability and transparency through adoption of consumer charters and consumer best approaches will be very key. And further to provide expedite and expeditious and inexpensive systems for access and delivery of justice when consumers have got um, ha have got concerns. Further, institutional and human resource capacities for effective implementation of consumer regimes is going to be crew, uh, very important. Next. So as I as I take home, I always tell my colleagues when I'm I, I, I'm chairing that our coming together was a beginning. Keeping together will be progress and working together will be success. So Araso Coco will be very key in all that we do to bring the missing link into play and also develop a quality culture and make a meaningful uh, uh, continental area to work. And I always tell them that if we think that we are too small to make a difference as an, a committee, I always tell them that if you ever thought that we were not big enough to make a difference, we, that means they have never shared a bed with a hospital. So I always encourage them that let's go in there and let's work and deliver on our terms of reflex. My last slide, please. I would like to give the last slide by saying, colleagues, leadership is not about size. It is all about wisdom, uh, knowledge and wisdom. And this is what we are trying to build ever since we started our operations at Araso Coco to make sure that consumers are not a missing link. Consumers are in position to speak to business and consumers are in position to make a difference with the knowledge and wisdom. Thank you very much. Thank you, Henry. Uh, <laughs> we have never shared the bed with a mosquito. <laughs> it's it's very very interesting. It's even very good that the, the, you think that the consumer committee of Arzo can make a huge change and bring together the consumers and actually buy African product. Why do you think that uh, they, we can change the mind of consumers 
and we start forgetting the labels. You know, we love labels. Yeah, we, 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 when you go to a shop, uh, you look for a Nike, Adidas shoe, or you look for other labels when you are buying a, co a, a suit or a car. Yeah, wh why do you think that we can change the mind uh, of, of the consumers? Do you think participation in the standardization work can help to build trust among our consumers and start buying African product? Yes, I do. And that's why, not just for, uh, for the presentation here, I wear the African, or I put on African because I believe that African can do, and also following the theme of Araso, promoting the African culture and design and attire. So that's why I took it on. So it starts with the mindset, like Francis said earlier, and the best way to do that is one, consumer involvement and in constant dialogue with them will help them to believe in themselves. I would say with all the years that I have been in uh, doing consumer advocacy, I started from different aspects and I was even called a, a business saboteur when I was raising consumer issues. But I kept on raising the confidence of both in government, those in business, and then in consumers. And to date, one of the things that is top on my agenda nationally is bringing in young consumer advocates to be in position to use the digital a world to promote aspects. Now you look like if we give the consumers confidence, there is a lot to deliver. I already, if I go to the agriculture sector, I always call for farmer consumer dialogue. Consumers to tell the farmers what their challenges with their produce is. Now, if consumers tell businesses that whatever you are providing us Currently, we are having a supplier-driven market, but now we need to have a market that is producing to address consumer messages, where consumer goods, products that are linked to consumer demands. And the aspects Francis raised, the aspects uh, Sharon has raised with the motor industry, these once they, we have got that dialoguing aspect, that will help consumers trust in the continental products. Once they, there's a listening ear to the consumer, rather than saying, calling them sentiments that we raise when we spend our earned money on a product that doesn't meet our needs. But once there is a platform to listen to us, to participate in developing products that are meeting our needs, there will be a great in promoting the African continent produce products and also taking on technologies developed in the, on the African continent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Henry. Uh, I, I, it, it's a very important, as you said, that actually we start targeting the youth. Uh, I, that is very important. Probably uh, as we have been corrupted by the, 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 the suppliers. Yeah, targeting the youth, I think it's very, very, very important going forward and uh, start awareness and mobilization. Thank you very much, Kimera. Uh, our next speaker uh, is um, a, a also from the Consumer Committee of uh, International Standardization Organization, ISO, Copolco, uh, Ms. Sadi Dainton. Uh, we go again to the consumer voice. Uh, matters in standardization, international trade, uh, the best practice 
for safeguarding consumers' interests and rights. The lesson learned, and uh, she has a very huge experience, Sadi. Uh, can you tell us the best practice and the lesson learned? Uh, Sadi, please. Thank you, thank you, Hamajin. It's uh, very good to be here. Um, and um, I will just share my screen. Thank you. Hopefully everyone will be able to, to see my slides as they come up. Yes. But first oh, I want to say, you know, to the uh, ISO Capulco to speak at this event. Um, it's really important for ISO Capulco to have that really close connection with, with ISO and also with ISO COCO. And uh, you can, great. Digital problems are, are global, I think. <laughs> but hopefully it, it will come shortly. Um, I wanted to say um, as well to send greetings from uh, Guillermo Zucal, who's the chair of ISO Capulco. And, um, and also I'm very honored to be here. I was had the pleasure of being at the um, meeting of ISO Coco in Ethiopia in 2016. And also um, to, to celebrate um, that the first meeting of ISO Capulco in Africa took place in Zimbabwe in 2019. In fact, uh, this first, uh, the last time we were all able to meet face to face uh, since, since the pandemic. So I'm wishing I was in Africa today because it's pouring with rain here, but um, it's good to speak to you all in, in any case. I'm just gonna start my presentation um, the information about Capulco there, um, the, and you can see in this this cloud um, sharing how many standards actually impact consumers every day. We can see electric vehicles, um, things like ladders um, at consumers every day are very vast, and also these products and services don't just impact consumers in one country, um, they impact consumers in every country. So that's really the, the mandate of ISO Capulco is to bring together the national standards bodies who are the members of ISO Capulco, but also the consumers, the consumer groups that are present in each I think I think we will have lost Sadi. Sadi. Sadi, probably you can you can switch off the video and just do the presentation. Yeah, to reduce the bundles. Thank you. Um, thank you. I will do that. Hopefully you can be able to see. The, the slides again now. Yes, we can see the slide. Oh, yeah, great, thanks. great. So I was mentioning that Capulco mean, brings the consumers together to, to focus on the standards that minimize the risk of consumer harm, um, help responsible business provide a good consumer journey that they want to do again, and also to give government the tools to support consumer protection. And um, I mentioned a few more of the standards that Capulco has brought together, but mentioning secondhand goods where Capulco uh, worked together with African countries who already had national standards that up, uh, provided a really good basis for the international work that was developed from that. You can see, you know, we're living in a very changing world and consumers, as, as Henry's mentioned and others have mentioned, consumers are really at the heart of that world. They're the biggest economic group and we really need to engage the trust and confidence of those consumers 
uh, to move, move forward in this in this changing work, changing world. So although, as you can see on the on the left here, uh, global markets, smart products, digitalization, e-commerce, new production methods, all of these are, are new and advancing technologies that impact trade, that impact uh, the way the world works. But at the center of that is consumer behavior. And consumer behavior is really, um, has a huge impact on how the global markets work. We've seen with the, um, pan the pandemic and the move to online um, for consumers, it's brought a seismic shift in how markets operate and how cross-border trade works. So it's really important to take account of how consumers feel about this, about the new challenges for consumers and those who protect them. And I think this points to the fact it's even more important to have consumers at the heart of those standards and reflecting that change in behavior that can help make much um, more responsive standards and standards that actually meet the needs of consumers uh, wherever they, they are living. On the right, you'll see there, these are the principles that have come from the United Nations Consumer Protection Guidelines. And if you look at all these individual elements, access, inclusivity, information, redress, representation, safety, sustainability, privacy, you can apply all of those key issues and legitimate needs for consumers to the topics on the left and see how important it is going forward to make sure consumers are involved and integrated into the standards that are developed in these areas going forward. Yeah. And hopefully that's changed for you too. Um, but of course, Capolca has been in existence for some years, as has consumer protection. So it's not just the standards that are being developed in the future, but it's using the standards that have already been developed and can be useful uh, to consumers, to sustainability, to business and government. And I'm just put up here a few of the examples um, as we get into that Royal Standards Speak of, of technical committees and uh, what standards are called. But really at the basis of this is all of these standards have either been initiated by ISO Capulco, by the consumers that engage uh, through ISO Capulco with the national standards bodies, or they've been heavily influenced by consumers being represented in those committees and in developing those documents that give the best practice guidance uh, to when they're used. So it's incredibly important that not only do we develop standards, but we use them. But also it's in very important that the impact, robustness and credibility in standards have to reflect this, all of the stakeholders that are going to use them. So they need the participation and integration and thought from the national standards bodies, from the consumers in those countries to reflect the different economic, geographic, climatic and societal groups. As only then will there be truly international standards that can be used around the world for the benefit of all society. I'm just going to give um, a quick example of something that's happened recently because I think often people see the international standards as something far removed from from their country or maybe far removed and, and uh, imp impossible to start to influence and uh, this is an example which is imp impacting consumers everywhere around the world at the moment with the impact increase of online terms and condition increase of online marketplaces. And that is what are the terms and conditions? How do consumers understand them when they are um, starting to venture to have the confidence to use, um, I think uh, Hermogene in, in, in the beginning, you know, you mentioned how, how large the African potential African market is and how many more consumers are now using their mobile phones, um, using um, iPads, using uh, technology to actually buy, particularly in the in the pandemic when it's much harder to go to stores. 
So this is something that actually came from a, a document created by the UK government, but they did that based on looking at a consumer behavior. So they produced a best practice guide to guide business in how can they best communicate with their consumers around what the terms and conditions are. So a simple example of that is if you buy a product online, how much would it cost you to send it back? If you're importing a product from a different country within Africa, do you have to pay customs? Uh, in the UK at the moment, uh, with leaving the European Union, many consumers in the UK are suddenly finding they buy something online, they didn't realize they bought it from another country in Europe, and when it arrives, having to pay customs. How can you complain to this online provider? How can you contact them? Um, so there's all these many issues. And as the world becomes more global, these consumer issues are the same in every country around the world, regardless of the, of, uh, the climate and, and the geographical situation. Consumer problems are melting and becoming uh, more similar. So you can see here, uh, what happened next was the Consumer and Public Interest Network, who are an independent consumer group who represent consumers in standards in the UK, decided this was such a good idea that actually they wanted to share this, not only as a British standard, but through ISO Copolco to develop an international standard. Because online markets are international, there's no point having a national standard when as a consumer you're buying from um, might be from another country, another region, the other side of the world, you may not know who that is. So as you can see here, this went forward to ISO Capulco. The members of ISO Capulco from all around the world commented on that proposal. So we could integrate, integrate the needs of consumers from all the different countries of the world. And then this was put forward to the ISO members, the national standards bodies around the world who um, voted for it to be approved in over 25 countries, voted to be approved and no negatives. So, you know, this just demonstrates how working together, as Henry mentioned, uh, whether it's working together in Africa or work, working together at a global basis, then you can result in having a very positive impact on the world, uh, not only to protect consumers, but to help reduce uh, plastic waste, which is the topic of World Consumer Rights Day this year, because you don't want to be sending those products back. You don't want to be having to throw them away because you can't get redress. You don't want those products to be unsafe and causing you harm. So we all have to work together. And I think the this standard also demonstrates how um, consumer protection and helping and building uh, the confidence and trust of consumers is not just benefit beneficial to consumers. It's also beneficial to, to industry. So standards can provide good practice for business to follow to deliver goods and service to, services to consumers. That consumers can trust, it can build brand reputation and it can build customer loyalty. Also to government, that these standards with the involvement of consumers can help government and, re and regulators to use those standards to show to business and to um, um, international operators what consumer protection looks like and how to show due diligence. For is also um, a use of standards which is often forgot forgotten which is comparative testing. So for government regulators, consumer organizations, uh, testing organizations, to be able to use those benchmark standards to compare and contrast goods, to drive improvement and reduce risk of harm, building consumer trust and confidence is really a, a, a key missive of those standards. Develop them with the full participation of all key stakeholders, and then implement them and use them to make sure that consumers really benefit the most from those standards, as do the other stakeholders. So I think the key word is uh, collaboration. And just to give you some more information, 
So Capolco, uh, you can see more information at that link. But also all Capolco members are encouraged to join and participate in Capolco activities. Uh, any national standards body can be a member of Capolco. It's free to join. And so we do encourage all African countries, all members of ARSO to join us in Capolco so we can hear strongly the African voice as well as the voices from the other continents. And the next um, meeting of that plenary session is the 4th to the 6th of May. And there will be on the first day an engagement forum um, looking towards the global village, how consumers and standards bodies can work together on a glo global basis to help improve the world, to bring together and provide those legitimate needs of consumers. Uh, also be a regional engagement meeting planned for July, I'm sure with also Capolco in collaboration together to, to speak to the different regions. And do contact Capolco at iso.org if you would like any more information. I also, um, you'll note the, the photograph in the top right, so that's Guillermo Zucal and myself at the uh, last meeting, Capolco 41 in, in uh, Zimbabwe. So very much look forward to having another face-to-face -face, um, um, Capolco meeting after this one, which will be held virtually in this year. I also wanted to just draw your attention because it could be interesting you, for you to listen to. And that's BSI, the National Standards Body, along with the Consumer and Public Interest Network, uh, together with uh, Consumers International have recorded a podcast which talks about the history of consumer rights, what standards can do to help fulfil consumer rights. And um, with our new uh, technologies and ways of being able to communicate, not only can we, I can join you from a wet and rainy England today in Africa, but also hopefully we can communicate more and share better the needs of consumers through the standards bodies with ISO Capolco. So thank you again for inviting me today. And I've really enjoyed listening to the previous speakers. It's been very insightful. Thank you. Thank you, Sadi. Very, very uh, interesting that that's, we, 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 the, the ISO Copolico actually is spearheading uh, the standard on issues of understanding the terms and conditions. I think it's very interesting. Uh, you have a huge experience, uh, I, I, we, as we know, in these consumer issues uh, on international standardization work. Uh, and you mentioned this, that we are in a changing world with this smart product, e-commerce, a digitalization, sustainability issues. It, how do you uh, rank the participation of African uh, bodies or African consumers in the ISO Copolco? And what should we do if you, 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 we want to change something uh, positively and participate and make an impact? Thank you. Um, yeah, it's incredibly important. And I think that first meeting of Capolco in, in Zimbabwe in 2009, and the presence of the African members um, at that meeting really demonstrated that we have been missing the voice of African consumers in, in number. So after over, I know uh, Henry has participated in Capolco meetings over the last 10, 15 years, and it's always been good to have uh, a few voices from Africa but obviously Africa is a huge continent and we would really encourage all the African nature uh, countries to come together. Uh, we realize there's always resource issues, but I think we can see from today, we have new technologies, new ways of bringing those voices together. And I think through Arso Coco, um, I'm sure um, through that organization, there can be better input to ISO, uh, uh, ISO as a whole, but also ISO Capolco in bringing the voice of con, uh, the voice of African consumers from all African countries uh, to help influence and make sure the standards that are being proposed really meet the needs of consumers in Africa as well as consumers on, or in other continents. So we can make sure the ISO standards are, are fit for purpose um, globally. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Uh, is, is some other few question panelists. Uh, Serge, are you still with us? Serge, are you there? Or I start with I start with Henry. Uh, Henry, uh, there is a question uh, that came from participant asking what Arzo Coco is doing to build capacity uh, to for, for the consumer associations. Uh, as so many times we found out that their understanding. Uh, to in participation in standardization is very, very basic. Yeah, what Arzo Coco is doing to build capacity that those consumer associations can participate effectively in standardization work. Henry. Thank you very much, Mujin, and, uh, and thank you very much for that very good question. Uh, also, as COCO, what we are doing is that we have developed a needs assessment tool. That is one. And uh, like I said, we are doing stakeholder mapping plus needs assessment. And we are developing a work plan, which is in line with the business plan. We want to roll out to build capacity of the existing consumer organizations that will be mapped out by members who are who are on the COCO and in line with the needs assessment. I would like to share my experience. Way back in 1993, when I started consumer advocacy work, whenever I would share something I would be told those are sentiments. And I would say that standards development is about science. And what I'm saying is consumer sentiment. May you please get my consumer sentiment and turn it into science. It is a message from a lay person who is not a scientist, but you as a standard body, you as a professional, you are obligated and you are duty bound to listen to the consumers, build their capacity and enable them to effectively communicate and participate. So let me tell you what happened thereafter. And it's good Sadie is with me on the, on the panel. Consumers International under Codex Armentarius started capacity building agendas for consumer organizations in Africa to participate in standards development. This ran for around about two years, and this built the capacity. Different professionals, in most of the consumer organizations, they do not have professionals. But what I would pray is to facilitate them at national level to effectively participate and get the consumer views and incorporate them in the standard process. Because the consumer views that are brought by the wanting participation represent even our rural and urban kinsfolk who might not have that opportunity to come to the standards development body. So in, in essence, we have got a program that we are putting together at the uh, at COCO which we are going to roll out in member states. So the business plan is in place, but we are building on it a work plan to I, those consumer organizations that will be identified. Then we look at how best to build their capacity. 
one very interesting thing that came out of our one of the, our last meetings was that we are going to start a twinning program where there are successful consumer organization twin themselves with other consumer organizations so that their capacity is built. That is one, and the mentorship program. Then one other resolution that we have, we are going to get, currently they are ISO Kapuko National Mira Committees. It was, it was resolved that those Mira Committees are going to also take on the portfolio of Araso Koko at national level. And all the benefits that we get from Araso, uh, from ISO Kapouko will be in position to help build capacity at the national level with the Araso Koko arrangement. I don't know if that brings out a wider perspective. Thank you very much. It's very clear. Using the MIRA committees at the national level will help build capacity at the national level and participation at NSBs at country level will also be improved. Uh, while the members of COCO also come from national committees, it will be very, very much helpful. And we should see an impact very soon. Thank you very much. Is that the one question, as, as you said, <laughs> that we are living in a changing world. And uh, I saw a question uh, asking, uh, how can we uh, make sure that sustainability standards, that when you look at the West, the North, the Europe, the America, people are now getting very much aware of for sustainable production. And it look like products that are a collabed are just for the North, not for the South. And what do you think we should do that uh, we, we, we create awareness to the consumers uh, that sustainable production is the way forward, buying sustainable product is the way forward, uh, as, as we have also seen that uh, from Serge presentation, we are moving to electrical cars and so on. What, what do you think we should do for this sustainability standard? Uh, thanks, it's a really good question. Um, uh, as you know, sustainability is one of the um, key priorities for consumers and it's one of the consumer rights to have access to a clean and healthy environment. So it's, and as you see through the, um, the World Consumer Rights Day topic around um, uh, ridding the world of plastic waste, uh, sustainability is always on consumers' minds. Um, so I think the, the um, you, you mentioned that in the West, there's maybe more of a priority on sustainability. But I think from my experience, working with the different consumer groups around the world that actually sustainability, ethical behavior, um, good, um, good rights for workers, they're all things that consumers are increasingly interested in. Of course, when you have a, a challenge um, in, in an economy, um, certainly in the UK, the different consumers have different priorities and some need to put food on the table. So uh, they haven't got the capacity to make a sustainable choice. Maybe someone uh, who has a better income can make a choice between a fair trade product and an ordinary product. But I think the thing for, for all consumers is that the sustainable choice needs to be the easy choice. And so we look towards the manufacturers, to the business, to the governments, to help consumers make an easy choice that is sustainable. Uh, consumers have to make many decisions every time they, they purchase something, every time we, we um, sort of drink water or we, we have to access, we have to think of many different decisions. But I think you would find a, a global interest in sustainability. Um, so I think it's really, again, it's that collaboration, hearing that consumer voice in those international standards that are being developed to make sure that the consumer voices um, are heard and that the international standards that are being developed to promote sustainability are seen as a tool um, 
to improve the trust between those businesses and consumers. So, so there's raising that awareness uh, to consumers of the, uh, the right to a sustainable choice, um, but also engaging with all the consumers in developing those standards to make sure that they are fit for purpose for, for consumers. They have the information to make a sustainable choice. Uh, um, so I think um, all in all, I think you know, sustainability is, is never a national problem. It's always a global problem. And we have to all work together globally um, to make sure that we can improve the sustainability options for consumers. Thank you very much. Yeah, actually looking at the pollution, as we said, air pollution is not having borders. Yeah, we should work sustainably and all of us. Thank you very much. Moving to concluding this webinar, I would like to ask Francis, uh, one question and you give you a, a takeaway a recommendation, one key recommendation that we should take away. But before you give your recommendation, uh, uh, there was a question on viral chain, automotive viral chain. Uh, do you think the automotive viral chain can be a game changer for industrialization in Africa and improve intra-Africa trade, Francis? Yeah, the, the, uh, yes. My response is a uh, definite yes. It's a uh, definite yes. The automotive uh, sector can be uh, a game changer. Uh, uh, the automotive value chain can be a game changer in Africa. And uh, the example that, uh, an easy example that can be given uh, to show this is the Southern, the South African one. The, as you may know, in Southern Africa, that's uh, so, uh, countries uh, uh, such as South Africa, Lesotho, which is a much smaller country compared to South Africa, Eswatini, US, formerly called Swaziland, you know, Lesotho, uh, Botswana, and Namibia, and things like that. So in that part of the world, South Africa hosts uh, the, uh, shall I say, the engine or the headquarters, or is the hub for the automobile uh, sector. Now, what has happened over the years is that uh, the neighboring countries have started supplying this hub, uh, the components uh, that go into the production of a, of a car, such as uh, leather products, for instance, the seats and things like that, you know, the, the rear view mirrors and things like that. Now, if you look back, say, 10 to 15 years, this wasn't happening. But over time, it started happening. And now, as we speak today, countries such as Lesotho are big suppliers of inputs into production of uh, automobiles, uh, which takes place in, in South Africa. And of course, South Africa in turn exports uh, to the region, but as well as to the US and Algoa and other markets around the world. So as the automobile uh, hub has grown, the demand for inputs has also grown. So as they say, the tide has lifted all boats. You know that expression that the tide lifts all boats. So the, yes, the, the people who provide inputs also benefit. So that's a clear example of how the automobile sector uh, benefits. Now, as you may also know, production of a car has got uh, lots and lots of uh, parts, more than 30,000 parts. So this is ranging from uh, the textile sector to the leather sector to, of course, the steel and iron and all, all, all those sorts of things. So it, it has got such enormous potential. And uh, in terms of demand for cars, 70% uh, of the African continent is youth with the changing lifestyles, you know, uh, demand upward, upwardly mobile uh, population. So I think the demand for cars is going to be high. So that's why we had uh, Serge making a, that's a powerful presentation on the automobile uh, plants in uh, Rwanda, but also telling you that we now have the African Automobiles you know, um, Association. Yes. Yes, we, which actually now brings together all the automobile producers in Africa, ranging from uh, Egypt to you know, South Africa, Ghana, Nigeria, working together to see how they can, you know, 
put together these value chains across the whole of, of Africa. So there is something in it. And we as secretariat, as Sergio again told you, have not hidden our interest in promoting the automobile sector because we see a lot of potential in it. So we are working with this uh, association that see how the automobile sector can uh, create wealth and, uh, and help the, the whole continent through value uh, chains. Uh, we are also looking into the position paper which has been they have produced the automobile association uh, to see how it can inform uh, negotiations so that there's a good uh, outcome. Now, for my last uh, uh, recommendation, listening to all the presentations which I have thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed, I think uh, there is need to promote consumer awareness. It, it is a social political process. It's a social political process. So awareness creation, whether it is through the social media, using all sorts of platforms at our disposal, whether it is through messages on the uh, television, on radio, including community radio, uh, about the importance of uh, uh, in, inputting into policy, into standards as consumers. The message that consume, the consumer is king, the consumer has a voice and therefore should be heard. I think this is extremely important. And what we are doing here is part of it, part of this awareness creation uh, exercise that needs to uh, happen. And also now consumers are just individuals, they need to be organized. So the work that people like Henry are doing and have been doing over the years, I met Henry long ago when he was a young man, he's now grown up a bit. <laughs> Henry, I hope you don't mind my saying that, yes. Yeah, so he was fiery, he was always fiery, yes. So I think they need to organize themselves into association associations have spokespersons, energetic spokespersons, who can actually speak on their behalf. All this, I think, helps. And of course, as you pointed out yourself, Secretary General Hamogen, uh, we also need to be aware of the need to protect the environment and the consumers protect the environment. You saw how, for instance, in uh, Rwanda, when they, they stopped uh, the use of plastics, I think the environment has greatly improved through just that policy measure. But also need, consumers need to buy in, they need a buy in to know that this is good for, for them and for, for them as people, as consumers, but for the whole country. So this would be my last uh, message, awareness creation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. We will continue working together on that awareness creation with the secretariat. Thank you a lot. Uh, Henry, in two minutes, what is the takeaway message? Uh, thank you. Let me let me start off where Francis said he saw me when I was young and I was firebrand. I used to walk hours doing surveillance on the Ugandan markets and making reports. That's why you see one of my starting points, and it is not different from yours, that empowerment of consumers is going to be very pertinent, and in particular young consumers and who are the majority so that they make a difference. Having said that, the second parting voice would be without quality culture in whatever we are doing on the continent, we will not build confidence in the African consumer to think and trust and buy the African products. Why they are going in for labels? Because we have not built their confidence. So we need to have a quality culture in whatever we are doing to build consumer confidence and trust of the African goods and services. Then lastly, as chairperson of COCO, at COCO, we are going to continuously plan do, check, and act to empower consumers, consumer organizations, and advocate from national level, regional, and global level. And also through partnership to realize our objectives. Thank you very much. It was an honor and a great pleasure to have all colleagues as panelists and all the 90 plus participants and to you, Secretary General, and your teams for a very good Zoom meeting commemorating the World Consumer Rights Day of 2021. Thank you, and let's keep cooperating.
Thank you, Henry. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, it, it's very important what you said, quality culture, quality culture, quality culture to build trust for our product. Thank you a lot. Sadi, what is uh, the takeaway, take home message? Well, I, I think um, Henry um, sort of made some very good comments there, which I totally agree with. But my, my takeaway comment is to, to also, to also Coco, keep developing, keep doing what you're doing. Um, please come and join us at, ASA, at ISO Capolco uh, to make sure the African voice is heard at the international level, because I think there's many attributes that uh, can be brought and, and can help our, our world be a safer, fairer place for all consumers uh, with your contribution. Thank you, Sadi. Yeah, we say in the conclusion that quality culture, consumer awareness, uh, looking at comparative advantage to increase intra-Africa trade, targeting youth in our mobilization and creating awareness, adapting to a changing environment, looking at digitalization, sustainability standard, that is very, very important. I thank the experts that shared with us their knowledge, Francis, uh, thank you very much. Serge, thank you very much. Henry, thank you very much. Sadi, thank you very much. And most importantly, also, I would like to thank you participant who managed to uh, attend this webinar. Uh, we have our next webinar uh, next month. Uh, we thank you very much for the contribution to the chat. Uh, we will share the recording and we will share the presentation. I thank you. Looking forward to see you in our next webinar next month. Thank you very much and uh, enjoy the consumer week. Thank you. Bye.